A group of skeptics are meeting in Toronto next month to question the events of 9-11. The meeting comes as thousands are set together to remember the lives lost on this, the 10-year anniversary of those attacks. The conspiracy theory meetings are set to take place at Ryerson University, and that's where CV's Amanda Blitz joins us now. Amanda. Hi, Jacqueline. That's right. Ryerson University, that's where we are. It's supposed to take place from September 8th to September 11th. You might notice the date. Well, that's got some people concerned. I'm here right now with the organizer of the event, uh, Graham McQueen. So, Graham, why are you having this on September 11th, the 10th anniversary? Well, I think the 10th anniversary is the appropriate occasion to sum up all the research that's been done over 10 years, which suggests that the story we've been given about 9-11 is not true. But what do you say to those people who say that it's so insensitive to have it on September 11th, on the 10th year anniversary? I think the people who find it insensitive are probably people who feel that, that folks like me are nuts and busybodies with nothing better to do. Uh, if that's your perspective, you would see it as insensitive. But if you open up your mind to the possibility that we are actually researchers, in my case, university professor for 30 years, doing my best research on this, and we're trying to determine what happened, why it happened, and who did it, those kinds of questions, and we're saying the official story is wrong. I think if you open your mind to the possibility that we're right, it's not insensitive, it's actually crucial. Why would Canadians want to build their foreign policy and their domestic policy on a lie? So have you faced any... Anniversaries are important, and we knew that the 10th anniversary of 9-11 would be important one way or another, whether we did anything or not. And I had some fears about how it would be used. It would be used to promote myth and lie and deception, it might be used to reinvigorate the flagging war on terror. Um, there's always Syria, there's always Iran, and so on left to go. Um, but there's another way that it also could be used that I worried about, and that is to put the whole thing to bed, so to speak, to say, this is now part of history. This is not the present anymore, this is the past. And because it's the past, it'll be in the history books and the kids will read it. That is the official narrative, the lie about 9-11. And I thought, in order to try and prevent that, we've got to have an event on the 10th anniversary which will say, this isn't over, this is just beginning. This is just beginning. We have gathered here at Ryerson University in Toronto for the international hearings on the events of September 11th, 2001. Everything changed after 9-11. That is a cliche and perhaps a politically motivated one. However, governmental responses to that day's events have reshaped our world in ways uh, I can only summarize here in the briefest manner. <coughs> the events of 9-11 have served as a cause or pretext for two major wars, producing incalculable suffering in Iraq and Afghanistan, and increasing instability throughout the Middle East. In Canada, let us add, there are parallel grounds for public debate and formal hearings. Two dozen Canadians were among the direct victims of the 9-11 attacks. Six times that number of Canadian soldiers have died in Afghanistan in the longest running of the 9-11 wars. And the kettling and mass arrests of more than a 1,000 peaceful demonstrators at last year's G20 protests in Toronto, while the police made no attempt to interfere with the actions of a disorderly minority, was one sign of the extent to which civil liberties have declined in post-9-11 Canada. The importance of 9-11 as a historic turning point, then, is not in doubt. But much of what happened on that day, in the period leading up to it, and in its immediate aftermath, remains in doubt, in terms most particularly of the agencies and causalities involved in that sequence of events. Our four-day hearings, then, will thus have a quasi-judicial structure. The presentations of the expert witnesses will be evidence-based rather than speculative. The methodologies involved, whether those of the physical or the social sciences, will be rigorous. And the information that the witnesses present will receive a further critical sifting at the hands of the panelists, both in the questions they put to witnesses and also subsequently in their final report. We all know what we saw, but we don't know what happened. But scientists 
have a distinct view of what happened because of their uh, professional backgrounds. And so it's meaningful when you get scientists, architects, engineers, the entire conglomeration of the community that has looked at what we saw and studied it according to the scientific method. In general, the hearings are intended to bring attention to the most substantial evidence that has accumulated over the last 10 years, evidence that the 9-11 Commission report and the various reports issued by the National Institute of Standards, Standards and Technology failed to adequately address, which demonstrates that there is a need for a new, independent, and international investigations in, uh, into the events of 9-11. The hearings are not a new investigation in themselves. The hearings will provide uh, a succinct summary of the strongest evidence that a new investigation is immediately warranted and that the international community cannot abdicate this responsibility any longer. The format and conduct of the hearings will be analogous to, though not exactly the same as, a legal proceeding, a criminal proceeding that is known in the United States as a grand jury hearing. The analogy between the Toronto hearings and a grand jury proceeding is not perfect because there are some differences in format and product of the Toronto hearings. The hearings are not being conducted according to any specific laws or legal procedures, and the outcome will not have the force of law. Instead of convening a traditional jury panel, we decided to gather uh, together an international panel of prominent individuals who have agreed to do what governments and major media outlets around the world have so far refused to do. Look at the evidence uh, objectively and decide whether it deserves wider attention. In selecting panelists, we look for two qualifications in an individual. Someone who is one, highly credible, and two, open to ob objectively assessing the evidence. Ferdinando Imposimato is the honorary president of the Supreme Court of Italy. As a former senior investigative judge, he presided over major terrorism-related cases, including political assassination. A former senator who served on the Anti-Mafia Commission in three administrations, a former legal consultant to the United Nations on drug trafficking, and the author or co-author of seven books on international terrorism state corruption, and related matters. He is also a grand officer of the Order of Merit of the Republic of Italy. Herbert Jenkins, a professor emeritus of psychology at McMaster University, worked in major research laboratories before coming to McMaster in 1963, an influential figure both in the psychology of learning and judgment, and also in the development of new forms of interdisciplinary curricula that have been widely imitated in other Canadian universities. He was awarded an honorary doctorate by McMaster University in 2009 in recognition of his impact in both fields. David Johnson is a professor emeritus of urban and regional planning at the University of Tennessee. A fellow of the American Institute of Certified Planners, he served on the staffs of the Boston Redevelopment Authority, the Washington National Capital Planning Commission, and the Regional Plan Association of New York a former chair of the planning departments at Syracuse University and at Ball State University. He is also a past president of the Fulbright Association of the United States. Richard B. Lee, our fourth panelist, is a distinguished professor emeritus of anthropology at the University of Toronto, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a foreign associate of the National Academy of Sciences he has served as president of the Canadian Anthropology Society and the Canadian Ethnology Society and holds honorary doctorates from the University of Fairbanks, Alaska and the University of Guelph. Over the course of four days, the panel will listen to evidence that has been collected over the last 10 years that contradicts the official government version of events. Each witness will present an opening statement and then answer questions posed by the panel. The panel has been given considerable latitude in the subject and nature of the questions they may ask. Uh, and we expect the witnesses to answer every question to the best of their knowledge. After the hearings have adjourned on the fourth day, the panel will reconvene over the following weeks and months and make a decision on which aspects, if any, of the evidence presented deserves 
further investigation by governments with subpoena and political power. The panel will then publish a final report, which I will help draft and edit, setting forth a recitation of the evidence presented and the panel's conclusions regarding the strength, the strength of the evidence and recommendations on how to proceed. The information that we receive from, from really all sorts of media, with the exception of the alternate media, the, the internet, seems to be uh, just kind of telling us the same story over and over again, but they really can't address the hard questions that are out there. They will say, they being those that uh, support the official story, that, well, all those questions have been answered. There's books out there. Well, they've all been answered. Surely they've all, all been answered. But when you read those books and when you get into those questions, uh, you find that they have not been answered. This is what we're talking about at the Toronto hearings, presenting this evidence to the distinguished panel uh, and, and packaging it. And I'm very excited to be a part of it and, and to hear the other distinguished panelists discuss the other aspects of the extremely explosive destruction of the Twin Towers, including nanothermite composite explosives found in all the World Trade Center dust. People that read this material and, and have looked into it realize the official account is, uh, can't withstand scrutiny. It's just full of holes and contradictions, gaps. Um, the difficulty is bringing this to the attention of responsible parties. The political class in the United States is, is basically you can't talk about it, much less do anything about it. And so I think bringing it to Canada and bringing everybody together and trying to put on the table a, a collection of, of evidence that we are confident about uh, can raise the profile of this issue uh, because that's all we have to do is get people to take a look at it. So I've been interviewed a lot, especially recently in connection with the hearings, and the media have been told, I suppose, for 10 years that conspiracy theory is the term to use and that's why we don't interview these people much and that's how we're going to disparage them when we do interview them. Uh, it hasn't worked very well for them recently um, because if that's what you've done for 10 years, instead of looking into it, instead of thinking about it, the most you've been able to come up with is the term conspiracy theory, then when you're finally confronted with a whole bunch of articulate, intelligent people together and they they just dismiss that as BS. What do you mean conspiracy theory? Let's talk about it. Then it turns out you don't know anything. You don't have anything else to say. So one interviewer after another, I find, has been speechless once you explain that the conspiracy theory label is useless. They have nothing else to say. Conspiracy theory is a, is a way of trying to discredit um, inquiry. I mean, it's perfectly legitimate to say, here is a very, very serious event that occurred. It killed thousands of people right off the bat. It's killing firefighters still today. It's used to justify war. It's killed thousands of American soldiers. It's killed millions of Iraqis and Afghanis. It's literally in the millions. And to consider that investigating the roots of that is somehow not legitimate, or that you have to be somehow psychologically impaired, some sort of conspiratorial thinking. They're trying to psychologize all this to where people can dismiss uh, people who even ask these questions. I think it's being a responsible citizen to ask questions of your government and to not just take what they say without any kind of critical thought. That's only half of it. We're, we're crazy nuts who don't know our feet from our hands and we're very dangerous so much so that they have at least two officers inside the U.S. government to deal with conspiracy theorists. The, this is, this is uh, Orwellian thought control. The government is uh, in the business of telling people uh, not to listen to conspiracy theorists. They can't answer the physics, they can't answer the questions, so what else can they do? Uh, when you're getting difficult questions, of course, you just smear the person that's, saying, that's asking those questions if you can't answer those questions head on. And I think the nice thing about uh, uh, these international hearings today is that anybody who looks at it will realize that uh, we're not walking in there with, with tinfoil hats. Uh, we are just normal people. We are ordinary citizens who are concerned and trying to do something about it. Um, we are not irrational people. We are bringing up legitimate questions that just cannot or have not been answered. We're putting our reputations on the line, speaking publicly about an unpopular subject. And all we're asking 
is that we be taken seriously and that the evidence be looked at. I think we face an uphill battle in our effort to establish a real inquiry into the horrific events of 9-11. And a necessary part of that battle was advanced in our four days of hearings. We have focused on the strongest evidence and reasoned arguments that the official account of 9-11 is not true. Any open-minded person, in my view, who genuinely seeks the truth and is willing to examine the evidence would support a real inquiry with the power to subpoena witnesses and with the political clout to pry loose from a secretive government evidence that they have so far managed to suppress. We really want to begin a long process of rebuilding trust in the democratic state in the only way it can be done within the law, by opening the government to the legitimate needs of its citizens to know and to see and to be heard. We should be a movement to rebuild trust through real inquiry. To bring about a rebirth of democracy and trust in the United States, this must be done in and by the people and, and some part of the state together. It occurred to me, as I tried to put forward to the questioners in the last couple of days, that because of the collapse of these three towers, there must be massive changes to the building codes in the United States of America, and I'm kind of willing to bet that there aren't any, and I kind of think that that is something that we definitely should be, uh, should definitely be explored. Why aren't there changes in the building codes? The, cloud, the towers collapsed. According to the uh, recognized authorities, this is how they collapsed. So what's happening in the building codes? One of the rhetorical devices used by the official story is to uh, say that we critics uh, are showing disrespect for the dead. And uh, on the contrary, it seems really important to say that by really seeking the true sources of their tragedy, of their deaths, we are showing real respect for them and not crying crocodile tears. The panel decided to present a formal charge to the general prosecutor of the United States and the prosecutor of New York City against the unknown responsible of the above indicated action further than crash of airplanes. And uh, to this regard, the Toronto hearing panel asked for further technical and scientific investigation by independent and impartial expert appointed by competent who's a magistrate in the respect of the rules of due process of law. This panel trusts the use uh, United States justice and in United States willingness to accept the truth. Nevertheless, if the inert and careless behavior should continue, we would be obliged to start legal proceedings before the International Criminal Court of Vaya, according to the Article 7 of the court statute. This article established the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court for the crimes against humanity as the 9 uh, event of uh, September. The International Criminal Court has been established in order to watch over the world of people against the crimes committed out of the declared wars. It is not a question of interference, but of justice and solidarity. I want to say that I am a proud and patriotic American U.S. citizen. I served in the military. I've been a federal employee. I've represented the United States as a Fulbright scholar in four countries. Um, and I think my country has a, has a proud history. Not all of it, but much of it. And we've done some wonderful things. And I. I have not given up on my country. 
I was at the original hearings uh, when the Twin Towers were proposed in New York as a city planner uh, in 1960, I think it was 67 or 68. And I supported the building, the building of the Twin Towers proposed by David Rockefeller to keep the financial district in the downtown. It was migrating north and that's why it was built. Um, I supported it because I felt it was, it made good planning sense. And there was a, a, I was well aware of the internal structure of this building. A very interesting structure, uh, unique actually. Uh, I had done work in structural engineering. My first degree was in architecture. And so when I saw the, the videos of the collapse of the building, I, I said, something's fishy here. And this was in 2002. I, it was very early. And I to talked to people about it, and uh, they looked at me and rolled their eyes, as they do. Senator Fulbright, who was my, one of my heroes, he wrote in a book called The Arrogance of Power, I do not think for a moment that America, with her deeply rooted democratic traditions, is likely to embark upon a campaign to dominate the world in the manner of a Hitler or Napoleon. What I do fear is that she may be drifting into commitments which, though generous and benevolent in intent, are so far-reaching as to exceed even America's great capacities. At the same time, it is my hope, and I emphasize it because it underlies all of the criticisms and proposals I make here, that America will escape those fatal temptations of power which have ruined other great nations and will instead confine herself to doing only that good in the world which she can do, both by direct effort and by the force of her own example. Uh, Fulbright went on to write another book uh, which he titled The Price of Empire. And in it he said, the price of empire is America's soul, and that is too high a price. Thank you. We are gathering together to demand a real investigation that accounts for all of this evidence that uses the scientific method relative to its examination that uses immunity to bring forth witnesses and takes testimony under oath. That'll be a real investigation uh, and uh, we don't know who is capable of performing that yet. That's beyond our area of expertise. But uh, we hope the Toronto hearings will aid us uh, toward that end. I look forward to the day that there can be a real, legitimate, transparent, independent court review of the information that is being put forward at this tribunal and um, the, the work of others who have done the necessary investigations. There's a lot of people that uh, are easily manipulated because all they basically have is a stereotypical value system that's dished out by the media. The average person goes to their newspaper and reads their, their local magazine and listens to their news. It's very hard to get people to break a habit that's been inbred in them for the last, well, ever since they were born. Um, so it's a difficult task. I think the alternate media, the internet, is an absolute critical part of this whole thing. I mean, the news shows are a farce. Don't get your news from TV. Turn off your TV. Get your news from other sources. I believe in human curiosity and human intelligence and there is a limit to how long people can go on thinking that one bullet inflicted seven whims on two different uh, people in the presidential car in Dallas in 1963. That, that sort of thing slowly becomes ridiculous because of what's being called paradigm shift. It's not that you persuade the older generation, the older generation die and then you have a new generation whose minds have not been distorted by the propaganda campaigns. Uh, would you have any advice for, say, a young person who is inspired, hungry for truth, and, and looking to make a difference? Yeah, I would just, uh, you know, watch the people um, that are, seem to be making a difference today. There are 
alternative journalists out there if that's if that's what you're interested in if that's what your talents lie where your talents lie that's that's a, an incredibly important part we frankly uh, do it appears need to build a new media that's it's critically important for the future so we need people to take to have the courage and uh, take the steps necessary make the sacrifices necessary to build that media take the risks and uh, if that happens, uh, I think that we're going to make a lot of progress in the future. Well, I guess the first thing is think for yourself. You know, don't, don't believe something because Peter Dale Scott said it, and certainly don't believe something because the, the New York Times said it. But uh, trust in your own ability, not just to uh, understand what has been said so far, but if you have the curiosity, Go a little further, get into the primary records and discover something new that nobody else has ever discovered before. That's relatively easy to do in this field because there's so much pressure on people not to conduct this kind of research that if you become independent and do it, you may find something which will contribute to the record. You need to wake up. You need to look at what's really going on, not just uh, the, the myth, the propaganda. I guess if I was speaking to young people right now, I'd say uh, your youth, your physical youth is a transient thing. Um, the, you, we barely get a chance to realize we're young when we look in the mirror and realize we're not young anymore. So, uh, you know, enjoy your youth, but that's not gonna, that's not gonna do it for you in your life. You've got to come on, you've got to come up with something that's more substantial and please don't buy into all the stuff about your career and that that's the biggest thing in life. You know, truth is important, goodness is important, compassion is important, helping uh, this planet is important, and don't hesitate to give your life to that, your energy to that. When I ponder the horrendous crimes of 9-11, I likewise feel sick to my stomach. It's a different sickness, but every bit as much vertigo-inducing as has been given testament here. Human consciousness eventually assimilated the pertinence of gravity and made peace with what it meant, once a heresy against ultimate authority, although it was, and we moved on. Institutions were erected that one way or another gave testament to the witness of science about gravity. And, and have no mistake about it, we have given witness to science here these last few days. Each of these witnesses, with a score of others doing likewise here, step from privileged place into the auger of history. Like Galileo, they glimpse the redemption that God, him, her, itself, willing, others might someday do likewise, made the mysteries explicable to us all. But when the mass media and every other institution of the land are willing to play along with contempt for laws of the universe, we've got more fundamental problems. In the late Middle Ages, so-called scholastic philosophers confronted with mounting evidence for a world governed some other way than had for so long been ex sect accepted, preoccupied themselves with the relevance of angels dancing on pinheads, as if that was the most relevant consideration for them to sort through. I'd like to take solace in some positive headlines in the next few days, glimpse some sort of confirmation that the beautifully shameless testaments made here have made it past the matrix sentinels for the time being. I know that headlines will never be enough. I think all of us know that. But one thing I know for certain, although so many of them want free people thinking otherwise, we who are free are not lone wolves, not now and not ever. Something other than physical laws binds us together now, us who gave witness to these testaments here, so, so wonderfully done. We might be exiles from the matrix of received wisdom from a pliant media, but as Morpheus in the film story The Matrix said, we are still here. Here's to hoping soon for a world full of exiles. Thank you.